Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us for as we kick off our John P. Emily Jr. series on entrepreneurship for the 2021-2022 academic year. We're really excited to be joined by GT alum and the um, founder and CEO and CTO of Immerse. Um, and hosting our talk tonight is Dr. Bruce Walker, who's a joint faculty member between um, the College of Computing and the School of Psychology here at Georgia Tech, and he's also the director of the Sonification Lab. So we're excited to hear the conversation between the two of you later tonight. Um, before I turn it over to Bruce, I just wanted to let everybody know, um, if you look at the bottom right-hand side of your screen, you will see a little um, panel that says Q&A. If you have any questions that you'd like for us to ask Brindy during tonight's chat, please go ahead and put them um, in the Q&A. That does help us keep track of them. They won't get buried um, like they would in the chat um, and allows us to also, if we have links or anything like that, to, to share, to send um, in addition to the answer. Um, we can do so easily. And then if you want to use the chat, feel free to use the chat function to chat with the other attendees, tell us where you're coming from, if you're a current student, alum, um, or friend of the college, we'd love to know that as well. So um, with that, I will turn it over to you, Bruce, to start tonight's conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, we're um, we're delighted to get things going here. Uh, Renji, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. I'm just going to throw some softball questions at you and uh, and get the conversation started uh, real simple, and um, uh, and we'll 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 see where we go from there. But I just love to to open it up to you and and um, you know uh, give you a chance to uh, to introduce yourself, uh, tell us uh, where you're from, and 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 um, how you know the the brief story of of uh, how you got here. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I'm Renji, the founder and CEO slash CTO of Immersed. Uh, we're a tech stars startup that's partnered with Facebook, HTC, Microsoft, Samsung, and others to build virtual reality offices. And so, um, obviously, if you think about, obviously, COVID and everyone working from home, even Bruce at home right now, like, uh, you know, people have had to try to figure out how to adjust to collaborating with people who they used to collaborate with in the office, but now have to figure out how to do at home. Um, and so now, you know, uh, Immerse now has tens of thousands of people who are actually working uh, full-time in VR. Um, and so it's pretty mind-blowing, but if you have ever tried uh, one of the newer Oculus Quests or any of the newer headsets out there, um, it's pretty mind-blowing how far we've come. And so there were a ton of announcements today uh, by HTC and a couple of other companies about newer, even thinner, low-profile headsets uh, that are now coming out. So um, all that to say, it's been really, uh, you know an awesome journey. Um, it kind of started off. Uh, my parents moved from India to New York uh, before I was born. That's where my sisters and I were uh, born. And then when I was eight, we shifted to Atlanta. Um, I went to Emory for undergrad, went to Georgia Tech for grad school, um, ended up finishing grad school through the OMSCS program while working, um, but decided to kind of put that all away and just uh, build a startup. And so um, yeah, we went through a program called Techstars back in 2017. And uh, for those of you who don't know uh, what Techstars is, it's, it's one of the world's um, you know, probably top competing accelerator programs, um, competitors with Y Combinator, et cetera. So um, yeah, Techstars is an awesome program. We went through Techstars Chicago, not Atlanta. Um, but yeah, in that program was surrounded by brilliant founders. I learned a ton uh, from them. And at Demo Day uh, in 2017, uh, Immersed had essentially invented the first wirelessly streamed um, computer monitor screen into VR. Um, and so it was cool because it was enough for us to be able to raise a small 340K pre-seed round, enough for enough for like three or four of us to kind of heads down, productize that prototype. 2018, we got our first users working full-time in VR. 2019, those users were asking for uh, remote collaboration features so they could work with their coworkers. Um, and then 2020, COVID hit uh, and sort of, you know, perfect timing. Uh, everyone working from home and now all of a sudden there's a big need for us to figure out how to uh, create an in-person experience for teams that are remote so quite literally what immerse looks like today is you put on an oculus quest headset you pair it to your macbook pc or linux computer it spawns five virtual screens software emulated screens you don't need any additional hardware and you can take your laptop and your headset to your couch or your porch or you're on the road or whatever but you have five screens with you at all times 
Um, you could whiteboard in there. You could have your teammates uh, join you. You could pair a program with them, share one or many or as many uh, screens as you want. You could whiteboard with them, et cetera. So uh, we're quite literally recreating the experience that teams would have in the office, even though they're not in the office. And so um, as Facebook and Microsoft and Apple and all these companies are pouring billions of dollars into, the, into this next generation of computing, um, we're figuring out, okay, how do we make that hardware as practical uh, for everyday use as possible? And work seems like the thing that was, uh, was relevant to me. And so I decided to build that product because it just didn't exist. And so uh, I guess fast forward to 2021. Now we have raised uh, about $12 million, million to date. Um, we're a team of 25 people um, hiring like me, like three or four more. If you're a coder, hit me up. Um, and yeah, it's it's been an awesome, crazy journey, but um, you know, onward and upward. So. So I'm curious about um, the the process of of um, seeing this gap, um, and and were you uh, into VR? Or did you try it? Did you think um, you know w how did you get into yeah. this? Because many people were were thinking the the future of VR was games. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's funny actually. Before I had uh, pursued a degree with Georgia Tech. Um, I was actually working as a C software architect at a few different Fortune 500 companies. Um, and every team I'd, I'd ever been on or had led, um, about half of the team was working from home and they uh, and the other half on site. And they would always, uh, for our meetings, video conference in on Skype back then. And uh, it was just very clear that those who were at home were more so just listening in, whereas those of us on site were actually making the decisions. So everyone who was uh, Skyped in would be disconnected or disengaged. They just wouldn't really care to necessarily partake in the conversation. And so um, I just realized, uh, you know, this is back in 2017, that video conferencing and chat just cannot be the state of the art. Um, and, you know, fast forward to 2021, it's still kind of the state of the art. What we use is Zoom, right, or Blue Jeans or whatever. Um, and so we're really trying to build a product where in the future, when Facebook glasses or Apple glasses or whatever uh, comes out in the next couple of years, um, immersed would be the definition of what it means to go to work by putting on those glasses. And you know, whether you're in a boat in the middle of the ocean and your internet access is Star, you know, Elon Musk's SpaceX Starlink um, thing or whatever, no matter where you live, as long as you have internet access, um, you'll have access to uh, companies all around the world and companies will have access to global talent. So uh, the way I thought about this was just thinking about how, um, every, yeah, every team I've been on, this was a problem. Video conferencing chat wasn't the solution. And so uh, I remember thinking about you know, if there's a way to be able to transcend space and enter sort of a virtual version of an office, that would be pretty cool. And so I picked up a Google Cardboard, um, I put my phone in it, and I tried VR for the first time. Um, and it was, you know, though, though it was very blurry and, and kind of nauseating, um, again, back in 2017, 2016, um, I, I saw the potential. Um, I'd never coded anything in Unity or Unreal Engine or anything that uh, you run on VR headsets, but... Um, I'd been somewhat of a general technologist because I worked at a lot of different companies, but also was working on some pretty cool stuff in one of the uh, drone labs at Georgia Tech as well. And so um, I'd, I'd been a pretty uh, strong general technologist um, and I was just, you know, coding in C Sharp uh, for Unity was just yet another language that I could learn and pick up. And as I was coding the first prototype of Immerse, it really started hitting me. Wow, like this is what the future of work looks like. Um, does that sort of answer your question? It does, yeah. And did you have um, um, partners or, or uh, team members or other people that you were bouncing ideas off at that early stage? And, and, and what were they telling you to, to go or sit down? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had friends here and there who I was kind of dabbling with the idea of them being co-founders. But um, it was just very clear that I was the one who was doing all the work. And so I was like, all right, well, I definitely don't want to have to have a weight that I'm dragging. Um, and at the same time, it was very clear that friends weren't willing to quit their job to work on this. And so um, that's where I just sort of uh, jumped ship myself. And I, fortunately for me, I did have enough runway for a few years just to be able to kind of um, head down, focus on building a company. And um, when I pitched the idea to Techstars, uh, they weren't a fan of the idea, but they were a fan of me and the team I, I put, uh, put together. So the team I had was actually just me and like two of their coding camp students. So I was actually, when I quit my job, I was doing uh, sort of a, hot, a side hustle at a couple of different coding boot camps. And because I had access to like 40 different students, um, I just picked my top two favorite ones. And I asked them like, hey, uh, I know that you guys are running into issues around companies not trusting coding boot camps at this point. 
Um, but you know, you need experience to get on your resume and I need free labor. So yeah, let's do this thing. And so they ultimately ended up working alongside me, um, getting this first prototype built. Um, and yeah, I mean, the rest is history from there. So tell me more about the struggles at the very beginning of this, um, uh, convincing yourself and others uh, that you can uh, pay the rent and, and, and make this happen. Uh, that's, um, it, it, it's a it's a tremendous leap of faith, right, for an entrepreneur or someone to uh, to think I'm going to leave my my nine to five secure uh, paycheck for this other thing. How did yeah. that shake out for you? And 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 you mentioned that some of your 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 the people around you didn't make that leap, but some obviously did. Yeah. Um, so I think the coding bootcamp students uh, they. They had joined uh, coding boot camps from uh, already working in other professions, and so they already took somewhat of a leap of faith. So it wasn't that hard to get them on board. Um, but when it came to friends and others who I was considering as potential co-founders, yeah, I mean, it didn't click for them. I mean, this like, put yourself in the mindset of pre-COVID. Uh, you know, remote work was just barely on the rise. It wasn't something explosive, um, and COVID was a crazy catalyst for Immersed. So I think that's kind of what really made things take off. Um, when I started Immersed uh, in 2017. Uh, for the first three years, people were like, or I guess first uh, two and a half years, people were like, why the heck are you working on this? It doesn't really make sense. So sorry, three and a half years, uh, probably about, about three years. Uh, people just didn't understand why I was working on this and pain that I was feeling as far as uh, with remote teams. Um, just a small subset of the population, uh, even just a small subset of software engineers understood that pain. Whereas the rest of software engineers, you know, companies like Google and Microsoft and Facebook, like they all required you to work on site. Um, but then these sort of one-off contracting com companies or consulting companies, people would work from home and then they understood the pain, pain. And so when COVID hit, that's when it started dawning on everyone. Oh, wow. Like having a virtual office where you can put on a headset or glasses or whatever, and you teleport to the office and, not, and don't have to physically be there. That's when I started getting, you know, a hundred texts from people saying, dude, this makes so much sense. But, um, you know, I, I, so there was a leap of faith of me, uh, believing that this would continue to be on the rise. Um, but the hard part was we actually had ran out of money back in November 2019. So like four months before COVID hit. And what was crazy was at the time we were about seven people. I remember going to uh, my team of seven people um, in tears saying, yo, we ran out of money. Like I've been fundraising for the past four or five months. VCs are dragging their feet and uh, you guys are go, you guys are free to go look for jobs. And uh, seven of the seven of them unanimously said, we're not going anywhere. Just keep fundraising. We're going to keep working. And what was so crazy was, was it took six more months from there for me to close a round. And so they went six months without paychecks. Um, and what's so crazy is, I mean, those same seven people are still here today. There are seven of the 25. Um, they're still here till this day. And, um, and I'm just so thankful that they truly believed in me, believed in the vision. Um, and they did take pretty massive pay cuts. That's, that was another major um, important key factor was the type, the way I did hiring. Um, I made sure not to hire people who didn't truly understand and believe or have a deep conviction of the final goal that we're shooting for. Um, and so in situations where you run out of money, if they truly believe their equity is actually going to be worth, you know, millions of dollars there or whatever, the hope is, okay, sure, I'm not making a paycheck right now, but in a few months, I'm going to have a paycheck again. I can pay my bills and uh, I get to keep my equity. And so all that to say, uh, it definitely wasn't just, you know, sunshine and rainbows. It's actually very, very hard, especially pre-COVID. Um, once COVID hit three years in, that's when things really started taking off. But the first three years, it was definitely a hard grind. Uh, very few people thought I was working on something worthwhile. Most people thought it was a toy or a game. And um, yeah, I mean, VR has had historically had a stigma around it just being a gaming device. But the more and more uh, that companies are exploring virtual offices, uh, if you start Googling it, I mean, our name comes up there pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's, it's become, ever since COVID has become a huge um, source of traffic for us just because companies are now trying to figure out better ways to collaborate. So super thankful. So do you use um, uh, remote co collaboration tools in your own company? Yeah, so we use things like Discord, uh, similar to Slack for the sake of just being able to sort of like a text history. Uh, but our team, uh, about a third of us, I guess 10 of the 25, um, so two fifths of us, uh, work at the Austin headquarters, 
Austin, Texas, and then the other 15 work remote around the U.S. Actually, 12 of the last 15 work remote around the U.S., and then the other three, one's in Spain, one's in Ecuador, and one's in um, the UAE, in Abu Dhabi. And so um, we actually work in Immersed together to collaborate and to be in the office together. So we pair program, we whiteboard, like we actually use our own product in order to have a, a strong culture and a productive culture. So um, that being said, like Discord is helpful from the standpoint of being able to make sure we have text transcripts for things or like posting images and all that type of stuff. But um, if, as far as telepresence or being able to share screens or whiteboard together, uh, we use our own product in order to make sure that others can find value in it too. So help us understand a little bit more about what the experience is like inside the visor. Um, so yeah. are all your tools, like if you wanted to use Discord or Slack or something like that, is it inside or is that something that's outside? So the way it works is um, as soon as you put on your headset and you enter Immersed, um, the first thing it asks you to do is to pair your laptop. And so um, we have you download a desktop agent to your MacBook, PC, or Linux computer, and immediately establishes a connection between the headset and the laptop. And it literally just brings your computer into VR, but it spawns five software-emulated screens. Um, and so quite literally anything that's on your laptop uh, you'll have that in VR because it's just your, it's, it's, think about it as extended displays off of your laptop, but projected into VR. Um, and, you know, we have tracked keyboards in there, so you can, your keyboard, you can type, um, you use your touchpad to move your mouse between your screens. We also have uh, touch to click and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty mind-blowing experience. It feel, might feel a little bit of a step towards Minority Report, but the whole idea is to give users uh, flexibility and sort of a private, distraction-free solo workspace to start with. And then as soon as they want to collaborate, they can join their um, coworker or colleague's room and they, they can share, you know, as one or two or five screens as much as they want. So, yeah. And and so where does your colleague show up in your world? Uh, right next to me. So, so like we're, it's, it's, it's quite. Do you see a video of them or an avatar or? It's an avatar, yeah. So it's pretty crazy because, um, I mean, if the avatar gets too close to you, you feel like they're invading your personal space. So it feels very lifelike, um, which is the advantage of VR. It's a very immersive experience. Um, you quite literally feel like you have, you've teleported to another world. Um, and so we have some pretty cool, um, environments like you're, for one of the solo mode environments, you're in the captain's chair of a starship that is, um, or a spaceship that's in low earth orbit and you see the earth just sort of rotating. And so you're kind of left alone. You hear the hum of the engines or the rockets and you have your five screens around you and you're just, whether you're coding or answering email or whatever, maybe you have your Netflix up, whatever your workflow looks like. Um, you have all of that around you. Um, and yeah, as soon as you want to, it, we, we even have things like, um, virtual cafes. So there's something called the Immerse Cafe. And if you're just working at home, I mean, we have, again, tens of thousands of people who are working in VR now. Um, and, uh, there, uh a ton of them actually just go to the, uh, Immerse Cafe just to be around strangers. So these are like real live people all around the world as if you were just going to the coffee shop, but say you're at home, you don't feel like getting up and leaving. Um, you know, you just beam into the Immerse Cafe, you have your screens there, everyone's on mute. Everyone sees each other and some people have conversations, they become friends and they, they go to a private session, um, but others just sort of hang out at the cafe and get their work done. So it's a pretty uh, mind blowing experience. So is it the sense that, that you're in a, like a, an actual room and there, there's a table and chairs and you can sit at one and someone else sits at the other one and. Um, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but so, you're yeah. seeing avatars um, in a. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, it's avatars. Um, we're, we're, we've now integrated with this other type of avatar system called Ready Player Me. It's by, made by a company called Wolf3D. It looks a little bit more life, life like, so it's not very, it's not super cartoonish. Um, it's a little bit more professional. Um, I know that Facebook is going a little bit more towards the cartoonish side of things, but we're going to be, you know, it, honestly, it's, it's pretty, we surveyed our users and it's pretty split down the middle 50 50 as far as wanting to be or have more professional avatars or people wanting cartoonish avatars. So because of that, we're just going to give them both options. You choose when you want. Do you want to be more cartoonish or do you want to be professional? Uh, have at it. Nice. Uh, there's a question on the chat that I'll, I'll bring in here. Can we use um, Immersed even in Google Cardboard? No, it doesn't work on the Google Cardboard, partly because uh, it does take a lot of compute. Um, being able to render five high-quality, low-latency screens in VR is not an easy task. Um, and being able to have multiple avatars in there, we can have, you know, 20 to 50 avatars in there, depending on the type. If you're, if you're in presentation mode, um, and you're in like a lecture hall, for example, right? And you don't want to just do this Zoom thing or this, um, uh, blue jeans thing. You actually, you could be standing at the front of whatever amphitheater in VR and have 50 students in the crowd. 
and recreate what you used to have uh, in the actual lecture halls. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's those types of experiences can't work on just a phone um, or rather on a Google Cardboard um, platform. But uh, the Oculus Quest, uh, we're on the HTC Vive Focus 3, will be releasing the Steam layer this year. And so we're going to be, we're partnered with Microsoft as well, so we'll be on in Windows Mixed Reality. So we're going to be uh, continually expanding now that we've uh, raised 12 million bucks and have more, a lot more money to kind of focus on expansion. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be a pretty uh, eventful year. I'm excited about that. So what's the your your vision for the the um, the trade off between horsepower in the headset versus horsepower in the desktop? Yeah. So uh, the desktop's horse where that matters is uh, the rate at which the video uh, from the, your screen or like just like the video encoding happens, and then um, we're actually working on something called the Wi-Fi Direct, where your headset um, actually connects to your laptop split Wi-Fi signal as opposed to your headset connecting to your laptop through your router. Um, so oftentimes a router can be a bottleneck. And so we're actually working on something called Wi-Fi, native Wi-Fi directs, but it'll just straight connect to your computer. Um, and so that'll remove kind of some of the um, latency there. But your computer generally just focuses on whatever programs you're using, like whether you're using an IDE to code or you, uh, you have Gmail open or Chrome or whatever. Um, that obviously depends on um, how strong your computer is. And then as far as the headset itself goes, the main things that that focuses on is rendering the environment, rendering the avatars, um, and then just decoding the screens and presenting the screens to the user. So um, the Oculus Quest 2, I mean, as, as more and more headsets come out and uh, people are upgrading, you know, they went from uh, the Snapdragon, I think it was like 835, to now the Snapdragon XR2 uh, processor or the GPU. And so you know, every single headset that comes out, it keeps ste uh, stepping the game up. So uh, for us, the, down the downside to the, the VR industry right now, quote unquote, is that it um, backwards compatibility is not something that a lot of people focus on, partly because um, people are very incentivized to just keep upgrading. When newer hardware is available, it makes sense to upgrade um, because the previous hardware, it's usually a pretty big leap. Every year they have a new headset, it's a pretty massive leap in regards to innovation. Um, very different from, say, the iPhone. You know, no knock to Apple, but um, they have a ton of backwards compatibility because they do push the bar, yes, um, but also a lot of their applications are not as demanding. So uh, the, the newer the headsets that come out with stronger processors, we always push users to go get the latest headset. Um, and the prices have really um, dropped. You know, an Oculus Quest, uh, probably costs Facebook about $500 to manufacture, and they sell it for $300 because it's Facebook, right? They can subsidize the cost because they make a ton of revenue from Facebook ads. They're just trying to get headsets in people's homes. Um, similar to like how Amazon subsidized the cost of the Amazon Echo just to get you to buy it and uh, pay for whatever via the Echo Dot um, hardware and, and do Amazon shopping in your home without having your computer in front of you. Um, they will subsidize the, the cost in order to just get it in your home. Same thing with Facebook and, and headsets. So unpack that business model a little bit more. Um, what you see as um, who makes money in this ecosystem and, and kind of uh, in the short term and, and, and then longer term? Yeah, so historically the um, VR space has been mainly focused on gaming probably the past eight years. Um, and because of that, the gaming industry is very used to one-time paid fees for a, for a game, right? So they'll buy a game for 10 bucks or 20 bucks or 30 bucks um, one time. and the, on, on the business side, the game studio that developed it, they will invest, you know, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollars into developing a game. They'll release it, charge, you know, 10 bucks a pop and hope that it takes off. And if it doesn't, the game studio shuts down. So we're very different in the fact that we are a um, high growth venture backed tech startup. Right. So we um, are building a product that is a uh, is a subscription service. And so um, we take more of a. A B, so we're not straight B to B. We're not just enterprise as far as collaboration and all that type of stuff. But we're more of a B to C to B product, similar to like Slack or Dropbox, where individual consumers can go to our website, download our product, use the solo mode version of the product, and as soon as they want to collaborate with their remote team, they then uh, upsell to their manager on our behalf. They just tell their manager, "Hey, I'm using Immerse. It's been awesome. You guys should try it. We can all uh, collaborate together remotely." And then the the manager swipes a credit card, and then there goes our enterprise sales. So um, it's been very uh, successful from the standpoint of us not having to um, go out and do outbound sales a ton. Um, that can be very draining. And oftentimes in a uh, emerging tech field, it's a very hard sale. Um, and so what we do is we just make sure that the millions of users who are on the Oculus store get to have their eyeballs on us. They learn about us, they'll try our product. They, we, we offer a, a seven day free trial and then they make the decision whether or not they wanna upgrade to the prosumer tier or to the team's tier, depending on their situation. 
And so what is Facebook or a big company like that um, going to do? They're not they're not in it for selling the software. How do how do they monetize this? Um, yeah. This so new, uh, new world. Yeah, Facebook gets uh, so for the games, the one time uh, fees for games, Facebook takes a 30 percent cut. Um, and then for products like us, uh, once they do start getting their subscription um, feature set working in app, then they would take probably somewhere like but probably about a 15 percent cut. Yeah, but I'm thinking not, not not so much the monetizing of, of the software, but of the of the experience. Right. So um, you, in a Facebook, you know, obviously there's the ads and then there's the yeah. the, the user data that you can monetize and so on. Um, in a work context, um, I got to imagine that, um, you know, so say a, a Georgia Tech or an IBM or, or some large company um, uses this for a bunch of their team members, they're not going to let Facebook mine the uh, yeah. the usage pattern. Um, so so not so much um, data available. Obviously, yeah, they're yeah. not going to put up with uh, with ads popping up on one of your five screens. So how yeah. does this ecosystem sustain itself? Yeah, so um, Oculus is actually working on um, the Oculus Store ad system. So once you enter Immersed, uh, that's all our experience, right? Like we get to control what goes in. Uh, that product. So, uh, and then also we control what comes out of it. So, um, Facebook, they would have no idea which user is which. They would never know, oh, these are all the IBM users. These are all the um, Georgia Tech users. They, they wouldn't know that. Only we would know that on our end because we'll, we sit, we store that information in our database. Um, we have all of the um, rosters or, or uh, uh, the, the um, uh, access management uh, system kind of behind the scenes on our end. When it comes to Facebook, they just have you know, millions of individual users. So uh, Facebook doesn't really intervene on that side of things um, for a number of reasons. I, as far as um, longer term, I don't really know if they're going to be shifting in any of that. But as of right now, uh, they don't enforce us giving them information around who is who. Um, and I, I think that is for the best because at the end of the day, I want the users to be able to decide where their data goes. Um, and so when it comes to monetization around ads and stuff like that, uh, Oculus as of right now has not decided to pop-up ads in people's uh, applications or games, if anything, that would push away a lot of developers. Um, that would really anger developers. And so I, I highly doubt they're going to do that. They're just going to show it up in the actual Oculus store before you get into any individual application. Yeah, I'm a little skeptical on that, um, to be honest. Um, you know, uh, the billions of dollars that are being invested in this, um, someone's going to want to make that back. And um, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think the, uh, the, the, the difference here is, um, I guess the analogy would be it's as if Google, just for you to show up on their search engine, they require you to put ads on your website. That's not true. Google will just show it on the search results. And then once you go to the website, I mean, you've left Google at that point. And whatever the owner of that website, whatever the experience they dictate, sure, they can add like a Google Ads plugin if they want to, but Google cannot enforce that. So likewise with um, the Oculus Store, I'm not saying that Facebook cannot enforce it. As of right now, they're not enforcing it in that way. Um, I think it's going to become very uh they're probably decentivized uh, to do something like that because it would turn away pretty much every app developer if they did that because no Absolutely. one else is doing it. Same thing with the iPhone app store. If if you were required, you know, the Uber app or the Airbnb app was required to have Apple ads in there, Apple would rather monetize their actual app store now that Apple has announced uh, that they're moving its ads too. Um, yeah, th th that, that's just not something that we're super worried about. Cool. Let's change gears a little bit. Um, I'm one of the the, the questions in, in the chat is asking how you got into uh, developing uh, in VR since you didn't really have a big background in that. How how did you get started and, and how easy or difficult was it as you for you to become a developer? Yeah. So um, fortunately for me, I mean, it was just really cool to see how uh, along the way, um, you know, I don't know if you guys believe in God or whatever, but like or coincidentally, uh, I came across Udacity because the Georgia Tech program was using it, and Udacity actually had a um, VR program. And so, you know, how do you code in Unity? And so uh, me and a couple of people on my team started taking that course, and they did a great job of just onboarding me for the basics. Um, and then from there, I just took, I sort of took off and learned on my own Stack Overflow. Um, there's a ton of different resources on the Internet as far as learning how to. As long as you know how to code in general, you can pick up Unity very, very easily. So it's not that difficult. So you're largely self-taught um, in in uh, in Unity. Um, do you think? Do you have tools to help, or how will um, developers uh, build their own environments if they wanted to make their own cafe? 
uh, how yeah, would that yeah. work out and um, now and in the future? Yeah, that is uh, a feature that we are contemplating opening up in the future. As of right now, we haven't because our, applica our application is so resource intensive that any environment that has any inefficiency or say there's uh, way too many polys or um, the way that they're draw, uh, making draw calls is just inefficient um, or they're not doing any sort of atlasing or anything for textures, all that type of stuff can be very uh, expensive in our application because we're spawning five screens and you have multiple avatars, et cetera. So as of right now, we don't allow users to bring in their own environments. However, that is something that we do plan on opening up in the future, uh, but we have to kind of put parameters in place for, um, or essentially like they'll upload their, their custom environment. Uh, we'll run a bunch of checks and either it passes or it doesn't. If it passes, we'll allow it into the application. If it doesn't, then they'll have to refine their environment. So those are all things that are on the roadmap. It would uh, seem that there might be room in that ecosystem for, um... Uh, for a third party to build um, uh, environments on behalf of other people. Yeah, so, something uh, that we're or something we're actually really cool, or that, that we think is really cool, that we're really excited about is um, almost a way for, say, for example, um, me and one other coworker is here in the office or in, in the conference room right next to this office, and we want our uh, maybe two employees who are remote to join us. Uh, we're actually going to be working on a feature that enables us to. Um, 3D scan our room using ARKit just on the immersed app itself and upload that and then uh, the remote employees will download that to their headset and they'll be in that space with us uh, and we'll be able to use things like the pass-through cameras to just be in the space and we'll see our coworkers in there as well which is going to be pretty mind-blowing so really excited about that too. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, change gears a little bit more. I, I, I'm seeing questions that people really are keen to know more about the the, um, the startup side of things. So you've got this uh, self-taught, um, um, you've got a technical background, then you, you teach yourself Unity and you get into this and you say, wow, this is, this is the future. Um, can you share more about uh, the, the, the first steps you took in, in, along this road of, of uh, going from that, that, that moment of realization to uh, or that 5% that inspiration and the 95% perspiration? Yeah. Um, it's funny because I, there are people on my team who they look at what I do for um, a living. They, they look at like my responsibilities and my role as a CEO of the startup. And they're like, wow, I do not envy your job. Like they love doing what they do. Um, they love being the number twos, number threes on the team. Um, but they, they, they would hate to be the number one. Uh, and the reason why I mention that is uh, I'm the one who had to go through a lot of the kind of uh, suffering and groundwork in the first, uh, first place. Um, but before I actually jumped for Immerse, um, as I was going through that, that OMSCS program to finish the, the degree, I ended up doing sort of part-time CTO work uh, for a couple of different startups in Atlanta. Um, and it was really cool because I got to, for the first time, get um, a lot more close-up exposure to what it was like to actually run a company. Um, and I knew what in my head I, I would do differently versus uh, what I thought they did well. And you know, one of the companies, I loved the product, but the team culture was horrible. The other uh, company, the other startup, I loved the team culture, but I hated the product. And so there just wasn't a perfect fit for me. And so um, I was there for about six weeks at both startups, learned a ton. But at that point, I was just like, man, I think I just want to try to start this thing on my own. So fortunately for me, I did prep by saving a lot of money so that I had a little bit of a cushion. Um, but at some point, you're going to run out of that money and you need to uh, actually get something done and you really need to make something that people want. And so, um, and once you do build something finally that people want. That's something that attra attracts actual investors. And so um, another thing that was super helpful for me was watching the series on YouTube called How to Start a Startup. Um, it's, it's a course put on at Stanford by Y Combinator. Um, and I would just watch all of those videos almost religiously, quote unquote. And it was super helpful for me to uh, learn from all of the mistakes of other founders in years past. Um, so that I don't have to make those mistakes. And so uh, at the end of the day, I think Sam Altman, the former CEO of Y Combinator that said, um, the first 10,000 steps in the startup, you have to, you can't make too big of a misstep because you're gonna, the, the likelihood of failing is very, very high. And so the more you um, take correct steps, quote unquote, uh, the first 10,000 steps, they gotta be very meticulously calculated. And so um, all that to say, learn from other people's mistakes, whether it be firsthand experience at another startup or watch that series on YouTube. Um, but also another thing that was super helpful for me, um, I don't know where I got this from, but year, years and years ago, I've always thought to myself, like in, in pretty much every situation, 
what would, uh, you know, Renji's age plus five years, uh, what would that version of Renji say to the current day Renji? Like, meaning I'm 30 now, what would 35 year old Renji say to me in this situation? Uh, if I'm in a context where I'm um, learning from another founder uh, who, who has more experience than me, 35 year old Renji would say, shut up and listen, right? Or uh, if I was starting a startup from the ground up uh, when I was 24, what would 29 year old Renji say to the 24 year old Renji? Um, he would say, don't just flippantly do anything, learn a lot, but also at the same time, don't be uh, paralyzed by analysis, right? Analysis paralysis, um, take steps, 80% action, 20% calculation, um, and just go, go, go. So hopefully that's somewhat helpful. Who gave you your, um, your, your first uh, leg up? Say that one more time. Who was it that, that you, um, who was it that gave you your first leg up or your first um, help? Yeah. Um, so I guess there's a couple of ways to answer that. The, the first person who even exposed me to the startup world was uh, one of my best friends growing up. He was the best man at my wedding. Uh, he's actually not in the startup. He, he joined like series G startups, so like massive startups. Um, but he is the one who had sort of pulled me out of the corporate America world, exposed me to startups. As far as once I started the company, um, there was a person named Matt McKee based in Atlanta who had told me about what accelerator programs were. Um, and there was ex this accelerator program in Cincinnati that I um, had a pit stop at um, before I went to Techstars in Chicago. Um, and it was just cool to learn that there was this thing called an accelerator program that if you get into it, obviously they give you funding, but they also essentially help you to just quit your job and focus full time on the company and really uh, double down and really commit. So um, I would say Matt McKee, though he still hasn't invested in us to this day. And I, mean, I wasn't asking for a check, but um, he was such a great help. Um, he's a great angel investor in Atlanta, super solid person. Uh, him and I are still good friends to this day. Uh, he, he, he wished he invested, but, <laughs> uh, good times. Yeah. And do you think that you can be successful in a startup without going through a, um, an accelerator or one of those, um, structured courses? Yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, but in the startup world, you probably don't want to take as many risks, uh, more than you need to just because, um, yeah, I mean, it's something like 96 or like 97% failure rate, right? And so you do want to minimize the number of, um, and, and you know, the company, there are companies even out of, out of our Techstars class. Um, well, actually, I'll take a step back. So um, what's so crazy about Techstars is out of um, over, I think, 2,500 or 3,000 companies have gone, uh, gone through their program, only 14% of those companies have failed. So the other 86% of Techstars companies are, you know, either still, um, in business or they got acquired or the IPO. And so um, obviously a Techstars program or a Y Combinator program, you, the, the success rate goes way up high because obviously you're uh, selected out of tens of thousands of companies and you have to be the top, say 1%. But um, I will say in general, accelerator programs, uh, they already kind of give you a leg up partly because um, it surrounds you with other people who at least have more experience than you. If you're out just on your own, doing your own sort of rogue thing, um, not rogue, but just sort of independent and not willing to listen or learn, um, from other people, uh, the chances that you know how to make all the right decisions up front and do that all the way through till exit um, is super slim. So even Mark Zuckerberg, for example, had other investors early on. You know, uh, I, forgot, well, I forgot the guy's name from the, the Napster guy. I had him uh, give some guidance, and then Peter Thiel came in and wrote a first check. And so Mark Zuckerberg also had people around him. Um, Elon Musk, when he went to PayPal, same thing. He had Peter Thiel, Reid Hoffman, all these you know the founders of YouTube. All these people who are brilliant were also around Elon Musk. Elon Musk was also already brilliant and already had his first exit, but he was able to go to the next order of magnitude in, in scale and effectiveness and impact because he had people who were already operating at that level. So I think at the end of the day, uh, founders who are unwilling to learn from other people, whether it be in the context of an accelerator program or just networking or whatever, um, oftentimes I haven't seen them be successful. So, yeah. Can you walk us through the, uh, the process of getting your first check? Yeah. The first um, person to, to invest or the first uh, entity? Yeah. So uh, that first accelerator program was, uh, you know, I just went through an application process. They give us 50K. Um, if you get, so I mean, I, you can go to f6s.com. You can fill out an application for your startup and apply to different accelerator programs. However, um, realize that in pretty much every platform, there's always things that people have exploited. So there's accelerator programs on there that are horrible, that don't do a good job coaching or training you at all. Uh, they just maybe someone who just had uh, access to a lot of money and they just want to do a fun little program and they might end up um, screwing you over by just you know misdirecting you unintentionally. Um, 
so obviously do your research and, and, and if you can get into an awesome accelerated program like uh, Y Combinator, 500 Startups, AngelPad, Techstars, any of those, uh, Generator, those are all really strong programs. Um, but uh, as far as for me, my first check, that was an accelerated program. My first angel check, uh, apart from programs, um, after Techstars Demo Day, uh, there was just uh, an investor, or an angel investor group who saw my demo and it just blew their mind. And literally right there, they were like, all right, uh, tomorrow I'm going to give you a call and just make sure that we are on the same page with everything. everything. And then the very next day, they wired us money. So um, all that to say, that was a format or a context where uh, Techstars intentionally put on a demo day and flew in a bunch of investors to watch us pitch. So the intent of the event uh, was for these investors to consider investing. Uh, y Combinator does the same thing, but Y Combinator demo day is just like a whole next level of craziness. Uh, they do hundreds of pitches um, just in a two-day span, whereas Techstars, just 10 pitches at that one site. So. And how much, uh, what, what import did the, the demo have for that? Did the demo sell it? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, right after that demo, maybe in the next, like, obviously there's some logistics around getting the wiring information and then signing papers and stuff, but maybe about four to six weeks after demo day is when we closed that 340K pre seed round. So, um, mm -hmm. it wasn't by any means the largest round. It was like maybe somewhere in the middle. We had some companies that maybe only raised, yeah, some companies raised zero dollars in out of tech stars. In our class, uh, three of the ten had already have already failed at this point. Um, but uh, there are some that didn't raise any money that day, uh, or that week, or month, or you know the following months. And then there were I was kind of in the middle. And then there was you know I think two or three of them that had raised uh, somewhere between two and three million dollars right after the the program. So it varies. And how how functional was your demo at that point? Was it uh, was it show and tell or was it? Um... Uh, yeah, so our code was six weeks old, so I didn't expect to raise a three million dollar round. But <laughs> you know, the fact that they were able to well, number one, they loved that the code was only six weeks old and it was already impressing them um, at that stage. They put the headset on, they saw one kind of laggy low pixel screen, but they were able to see their mouse move, and they're like. I guess back then that was just a mind blowing thing. People just couldn't imagine uh, stuff like that back then. So. Um, Whereas, you know, we had another company in our cohort called uh, Swag.com, and they were already at like a million MRR. So completely different uh, sort of thing. Um, companies that go through Y Combinator, for example, can be as early as idea on a napkin, or they could be making 40 million ARR. So it just it really varies um, as far as what closing a round after program looks like. But um, in either case, it's just a very um, efficient way of getting in front of a bunch of investors. It's somewhat of a numbers game. So you get um, 350, 340,000, um, and and then you burn through that and you run run out of money. Um, uh, so we had uh, an additional 250 come in the year after, and then yeah, after that ran out of money. Okay, so so you're you're uh, sort of in in the five or six hundred thousand dollar range, and yep. and and um, year two, uh, and and then you run out of money. What do you do next? So I had actually. Um, it was already on my radar that we had about like four or five months of runway before we ran out of money. Um, and so I was already in talks with a couple of different VC firms. There's one based in Atlanta. I don't want to name them uh, just because I don't want to uh, defame them. But um, there's a firm in Atlanta. There was a couple of firms on the West Coast, another on, uh, in, in New York. And we were actually pulling together a $3.25 million round. Um, and so, but because um, one of the VCs or the one who's actually leading the round who actually was based in Atlanta, um, they were going to put in 1.25 million. Another firm was going to put in a million, and then a couple of other smaller firms were going to put in the final million. Um, and as that lead investor, lead VC, was trying to close their fund so that they can invest in us, their fund just started taking forever to close. And so, because they were struggling to close their fund, they never ended up being able to write a check in us. Then at that point, I mean, dragging, I mean, time kind of flies, quote unquote, when you fundraise. Um, because every week there's always some sort of excuse as to why a VC couldn't uh, invest. And so that's why, um, yeah, we, we had ran out of money sooner than I thought that we would, uh, or rather we it, fundraising took longer than I thought it would. Um, mm -hmm. And then the following year, I told myself that, um, the, you know, so the following year, you know, six months later, we ended up closing uh, like a 950K round because the $3 million round completely unraveled. Once COVID hit, that initial VC firm never even ended up closing the round. So it took them, I think, another eight months after that to even close their their fund. Um, and so they ended up not investing. Um, and I just got, you know, a couple of friends uh, and then like the million dollar VC who lowered their amount to like 600K. Anyways, somehow scraped together like 950K. Um, 
Uh, but I had half of that money had to go to back paying my team who went six months without paychecks. Um, and so I remember telling myself at that moment, you know, number one, we only have another 400, 500 K left. So we have like another six months anyway. Um, and then number two, I don't want the future of my company to um, be in the hands of venture capitalists. Nothing wrong with venture capitalists. It's just there was somewhat of a misfit of being an emerging tech, you know, frontier tech company um, and VCs who are used to companies that are printing MRR, um, just printing money every month. And so um, for us, I was like, all right, well, I got to solve this. This is not, not just we don't have to just solve private market fit. We have to solve this misfit problem between funding and our type of startup. And so that's when I had learned about um, equity crowdfunding. And uh, I, I remember surveying our users uh, and over 70 percent of our users said um, if Immersed opened up a, a round of funding publicly, then they would be in it. And so it was crazy. Like that first round, we raised about $2 million within four days. Um, then we launched the Oculus Store. HTC and Microsoft wanted to partner with us. Um, by God's grace, it hit Forbes 30 under 30, brought in a bunch of angel investor traction. And then March of this year, 2021, um, I opened an additional uh, crowdfunding campaign. And then we raised $8 million in 17 days. Uh, and so at that point, I realized just going the traditional VC fundraising route just wasn't a good fit for building something so futuristic that takes more time to kind of head down R&D and then slowly start making revenue. Immerse is now at the point where we're starting to cross over the 20K MRR mark. And so that looks a lot better now. But back then, we just didn't have that. Um, and so all that to say, that's also part of the responsibility of being a founder is figuring out how to keep the lights on, keeping your team paid and yourself paid um, so that you can pay your bills and focus on building the company. And it's a lot more than just going the typical VC route. Um, I will say that's one thing I wish that um, I had been advised better on earlier on, but at the same time, uh, crowdfunding was just newer. And so, um, yeah, we're kind of pushing, uh, like what's possible with crowdfunding. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens next year. Yeah. It's a huge uh, success story. And I think it's important for, for everyone to, to, to think about this distinction of, of being early in a, in a, in a, you know, before you're generating revenue, you're not interesting to, uh, to VCs. Um, but if you need a lot of money, um, you run out of angels and and friends and family real quick. So there's this interesting gray zone that uh, um, a lot of companies um, that that come out of Georgia Tech and and in the tech field face. And I think that the the equity crowdsourcing is um, crowdfunding is is a novel but um, probably um, durable source of funding. Yeah, and it's <clears throat> I I guess it's like it's something that oftentimes founders forget is that building a company is a lot more than just coding uh, a product. It's, it's you have to build this entity that, you know, legal hiring, finance, marketing, like all these different things on top of coding. It's a lot more than just coding. And that's, I, had I known that that's what I was signing up for, I probably wouldn't have started Immerse, so. <laughs> well, that's interesting. So sometimes what you don't know um, comes and bites you in the butt. But in this case, what you didn't know uh, helped, yeah. <laughs> helped you because uh, I, I think that's a, a a real concern for a lot of people. They get um, deer in the headlights, right? They uh, yeah. they look at all of these things and like I don't want to be a CEO. I just want to do my thing. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about um, um, CEOs for hire and um, bringing in people who have CEO, CTO, CFO experience um, yeah. and handing things yeah. over? Uh, that's something that I actually talked with. So, so by the way, um, of the 12 million we raised to date, about four, three or four million of that is VC. Um, and so I still have strong relationships with the VCs that are in our rounds. So even our crowdfunding campaign was sort of a hybrid round because of the eight million raised most recently, about two and a half million was VC. The other five and a half was users, followers, friends, family, et cetera. Um, yeah. And so I still talk with our VCs day to day. And um, one of them asked me, hey, like, do you see yourself being the CEO forever? And I was just very uh, point blank honest with them. I said, no, I don't. Uh, I don't see myself. If, if Immerse ends up becoming a super successful company that IPOs, you know, the definition of what it means to go to work is by putting on a pair of glasses. And he teleports to the office using Immerse. Um, that world where I'm having to report um, earnings every quarter, that's, that's not interesting to me. I'm a coder. And so for me, I definitely see myself as someone who starts something off. Um, and 100%, I do intend someday on hiring uh, a CEO to replace me, whether it be from within the organization, which is my hope, or externally. But oftentimes what I've seen thus far, at least, 
um, whenever you make external hires, it's usually a lot more difficult of a transition than if you were to just promote from within. But promoting from within, within uh, has its own challenges as far as people learning to submit to, to new leadership or, or um, authority who once was a peer and things like that. Um, so all that to say, like, for me, I really uh, love the idea of people within your current company today scaling in characters so that they might become the future CEOs of CT or CTOs of your company rather than hiring externally. Uh, but at the same time, like maybe the organization becomes so uh, so um, effective as like a well-oiled machine to the point where um, whenever you hire an external CEO, maybe it is very easy for them to transition in. So it just sort of depends on the business. Uh, there's a question of what uh, crowdfunding platform you used. Yeah, we used WeFunder because WeFunder does this super, um, uh, super convenient thing where um, usually crowdfunding platforms you know, if you if you raise a round with a thousand hundred dollar checks, right? So you raise a hundred thousand dollars, and everyone on average invests like a hundred bucks. Um, now you have a thousand people on your cap table. You do not want to have a thousand people on your cap table. Uh, with WeFunder, they consolidate all of that into one item on the cap table called WeFunder LLC. And so, um, for us, we had over three thousand people invest, and I'm glad I don't have three thousand people on the cap table. We just have one line item that says WeFunder LLC. And so, WeFunder is a little bit of a, a middleman for um, our company. It does make it also easy because I don't have to handle all these you know, millions of equity questions. They go straight to WeFunder support. Um, WeFunder does take a small cut. They take a cut only of the unaccredited money, uh, meaning people who couldn't otherwise go through a back door and just invest directly in your company. Um, angel investors, VCs, institutional investors, those are people who are able to, they're accredited so they can just invest directly. Uh, but WeFunder lets them invest on their platform for free because uh, it helps their numbers. Um, but when it comes to the service that WeFunder provides, it's very specifically allowing unaccredited investors, someone who doesn't make a certain amount per year uh, or isn't a certain net worth, um, invest in private startups. So highly would recommend would highly recommend WeFunder over any other platform out there. I did my research. WeFunder was the one that was the best, and I met the founder in person. Uh, he was a YC company founder, very smart, very brilliant. He's the one who's really pushing um, the the industry forward and really just the legal forward um, as far as lobbying and all that type of stuff. And so. All I have to say, if you want good advice, I'd go to WeFunder. Yeah, I'd have to second that opinion. Um, do you have demos uh, or um, uh, on on your immerse.com website? Uh, can people go and and get a feel for yeah. what this is like? Someone's asking, you know, can you see yeah. your keyboard? Um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of those kinds of questions that people still have about what's it actually like. So I, yeah. you know, presume there, there's a place they can go. Yeah, so you got to go to immerse.com and we have some videos on there, but also you can go to just our YouTube channel as well, just YouTube, youtube.com slash immerse VR. Um, there's a lot of videos on there as well. So uh, there's some like social media, like VR influencer videos on there. You can you know, look at that in your free time, but if you're looking specifically for research, there's a separate playlist for um, immerse features, things like phone in VR, keyboard tracking, things like that. So um, a lot of really cool things, things coming up. Also, in regards to even just keyboard tracking, that's something that we're working with on. Uh, working with Oculus on because, you know, for example, PC keyboards can look a million different ways. And so we're working on specifically P PC keyboard tracking. Um, right now we have a kind of temporary workaround where you would like calibrate a virtual keyboard to be exactly where your physical keyboard is. And so all that to say, there's different solutions that are available today, but I would say probably in the next like three to four months, uh, it's going to be a non-issue as far as how easy it is to actually get your keyboard in VR. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're bumping up uh, towards the, the end of our time here, but um, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, other questions that people are going to have. Um, and one of the, the the one that's just popped up is how do we connect with you uh, for future questions? Um, yeah. So yeah. So you can um, uh, you can also look me up on Instagram, Renji Joy, or on Twitter, uh, Renji Joy, or actually Twitter. There's no dot there. Just Renji Bajoy. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, my email is Renji at immerse.com. Um, yeah, just feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm a resource for all of you Georgia Tech people. So, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Jennifer will make sure that all of that is in the um, um, the, the curated version of this uh, this presentation, and and um, we're happy to uh, um, provide contact information um, so people can be in touch. Uh, awesome. What's next? What's next for you um, in the last minute we have? Yeah. So. Um... I'm really looking forward to what's coming out um, in regards to, I can't say too much about the new headsets coming out, but there are new headsets coming out. They're gonna be very, very 
um, appealing to the masses, which I'm really excited about. Um, there's going to be glasses. They're going to be extremely appealing to the masses. Um, and so I think a lot of people believe this is like five or 10 years away. Um, just Google the announcements that were released even just today. Um, this stuff is like a year away. And so it's going to be a pretty mind blowing world that we're going to be living in in the next like a year or two. Um, and the fact that a lot of these tech giants are really pushing immersed uh, to the forefront um, of virtual offices. Um, you know, yeah, there's a lot of different applications for, for VR, you know, corporate training, um, you know, first person shooters, like games and stuff. But I'm so excited about doing things like this in VR um, and immersed being the thing that powers that. And it blows my mind because four years ago, I had no idea that that would be us. And so, um, yeah, those are the things I'm just looking the most forward to is uh, it's really dawning on me how close we are to um, stepping towards a world where Zoom is not the primary way of remote collaboration, but instead it's going to be this. So I'm really excited about that. Nice. Um, Jennifer's here uh, to remind us uh, to, to wrap up. Um, thanks so much, Renji, for spending this time. Uh, super valuable for us to, uh, to, to meet you and, and to hear your insights. Uh, it's a great uh, Georgia Tech success story. We'll claim you yeah. um, all day long. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks so and, much for uh, having me. Absolutely. I know a lot of us are going to have questions, and I'll personally be following up um, with lots of uh, some uh, awesome. some ideas for discussion. Jennifer, what's next on our uh, to close this out? Yeah, so we have obviously been recording tonight's session. Um, we will polish things up a little bit, and then we will um, upload the video to our website um, and our YouTube channel as well, and we'll share with Renji and his team so we hope that you all learned a lot i know i enjoyed the conversation um, and hearing more about immersed and, and your personal journey renji um, so thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and bruce of course thank you so much for hosting tonight's session and asking all those um, tough but but really good questions um, and we appreciate that as well so thank you everybody for joining us tonight um, we hope that you will join us again in November for our next um, speaker in the series. Um, but for now, have a great rest of your evening. Awesome. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See ya.